brief welcome back and a couple of other general announcements. Thank you all for coming um, to our last event before the spring break. So uh, you know, this is basically the last thing for a lot of people before y'all head out to the beach or the mountains or wherever y'all headed. So be sure to enjoy your spring breaks. Um, our next event will be the week after spring break at our typical time um, here at um, on Thursdays at 6.30. We'll have a debate on executive power between Professor Logan Burney of Yale and our very own Professor Sandy Levinson. Um, that has become some of a, somewhat of a tradition for our chapter to host that debate every year. So um, be sure to tune in for that. Um, a couple of other announcements. Uh, you probably got an email about this today, but the National Student Symposium, which will be hosted at Penn Law this year, announced that the symposium speaker, uh, the keynote speaker will be Senator Mike Lee. Uh, we, our chapter is, is bidding on hosting that event and we would appreciate a, a rigorous attendance uh, from chapter members. So if you wouldn't mind at least making the keynote, uh, you can register for that online and I'll, I'll send over the link um, either sometime this evening or sometime tomorrow airing on sometime tomorrow. So with those several announcements, I'm gonna turn it over to Kylie who has a couple of her own and then we'll introduce our speakers and get started. Thanks Seth. Um, so this week there will be no Fed Sock Friday um, because we're starting spring break and we're gonna let you guys um, get your, your vacation going, but stay tuned for Fed Sock floaties. Um, you should have gotten an email from me about this. Um, we're planning a float trip April 17th. Um, please check your email for the Google form to fill out um, RSVP. If you can make it, we would love to have you. And if you need more details about that, again, check your email and my phone number's in there. Feel free to text or email me with any questions. So with that, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started and introduce our speakers. Um, our event tonight centers around Roman Catholic diocese versus Cuomo and religious exemptions in the time of COVID. Um, our first panelist is Professor Stephen Collis, who is a clinical professor at Texas Law and the founding faculty director of Texas Law's Beck Laughlin First Amendment Center and director of the Law and Religion Clinic. Before coming to UT, he was a research fellow at Stanford Law School and an equity partner at Holland and Hart, where he chaired the firm's nationwide religious institutions and First Amendment practice group. He has appeared before or practiced in multiple federal appellate courts, many state courts, and the United States Supreme Court. On the topic of religious freedom law, he is a sought after speaker to both academic and lay audiences across the United States. He's been interviewed by and quoted in various news and media outlets and a scholarly work has been cited by justices of the Supreme Court and has appeared in numerous law reviews. Our second panelist, Professor Jim Oleski, um, comes to us from Lewis and Clark Law School. Prior to joining Lewis and Clark Law School in 2011, Professor Oleski worked in the White House Office of Legislative Affairs during the first two years of the Obama administration. He previously served as an appellate attorney at the National Labor Relations Board, and he began his career as a law clerk to then judge and now Justice Samuel A. Alito Jr. Professor Oleski's research focuses on the intersection of religious liberty and other constitutional values, and he has co-authored two Supreme Court amicus briefs in cases involving First Amendment challenges to COVID restrictions. Our final panelist, Professor Josh Blackman, has served as a professor at South Texas College of Law and is also an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. His work has been quoted in impeachment trials, and he has testified before Congress, as well as advised federal and state lawmakers. He regularly appears as a commentator on political television and has published commentaries in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, in addition to authoring three books and several dozen law review articles. So with those three very impressive panelists, I'm going to go ahead and give it away to them and let us get started with our event. Professor Collis, it's all you. Well, thank you, Kylie and Seth, and thanks to the Federalist Society for hosting this. Uh, Jim and Josh, it's a great pleasure to be here together. I wish we could do it in person. Uh, you'll note I'm the only one with a fake background. That's because my house is under construction and I am uh, have been uh, banished to my bedroom and my wife doesn't want to show up on camera if she walks in behind me. The other day I was speaking to a group in your neck of the woods, Jim, and uh, some guy kept hitting into the Q&A, how can we possibly trust someone with a fake background? And uh, so maybe nobody can trust me because of my fake background, but that's why it's there. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to be starting off. I'm going to do a little bit of a, of a just a, a kind of a primer to get us up to how we can, I think, start our debate. 
And of course, Jim and Josh are welcome to disagree with any of the background I give. And then I'll get into my position on, on uh, the Catholic Diocese case and, and why I think, why I don't fully agree with it and, and the approach the justices took there. Um, as for background, you know, our story really starts, in my opinion, in 1990, uh, at least for simplicity's sake. And then in 1990, in a case called Employment Division versus Smith, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that under the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment, if a law is neutral and generally applicable, and that key is that, that term is going to be important, neutral and generally applicable, then government only needs a rational basis for burdening religious exercise. Since government can almost always develop a rational basis for its actions, most people felt that the ruling meant uh, there essentially was no longer any First Amendment protections against government burdening the exercise of religion. At least that's how a lot of people reacted. Now, scholars debate about whether this decision in Employment Division versus Smith was a big shift in the law or whether the court was just finally making sense of existing precedent. And that debate has been raging now probably really since the date Smith came out. Um, regardless of where you come down on that issue, that's not the issue we're debating tonight, this question of whether Smith was right. Uh, the, 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 regardless of how you feel about that, um, there are some issues you need to know just as a matter of background so you can understand the COVID cases. After Smith, there was a series of statutes and uh, Supreme, at least one Supreme Court decision that resulted in a world where courts used different standards regarding protecting religious exercise depending on who the government actor is. So in some instances, if it's the federal government or if it's a prison, then if government burdens religious exercise, it has to pass the compelling interest test, right? It has to show that it has a compelling interest for burdening religious exercise and that it's choosing the most narrow means possible for achieving that interest. But there are other instances uh, where courts apply the test from Smith. And I'm not gonna get into the whole background as to why there are different applications depending on who the government actor is, but just know that in certain instances, uh, the test that gets apply, applied is that if a law is neutral and generally applicable, then government can burden religious exercise as long as it has a rational basis for doing so. If a law or regulation is not neutral and generally applicable, then government must pass the compelling interest test. And at that point, it almost always fails. Generally speaking, uh, if, if government can't show that a law is neutral and generally applicable, it almost always fails the compelling interest test which is not necessarily true when the compelling interest test gets applied right out of the gate, just as a, as a footnote. So the question though remains from Smith, which is what does it mean for a law to be neutral and generally applicable? And this is where I think my position, where, it's where I know my position starts to deviate from certainly from Jim's and from others. So this is where we'll start to have a lot more disagreement. Um, what constitutes a neutral and generally applicable law? The Smith court never defined it. In fact, they never even asked for any briefing on it. They just declared it as if it was self-evident. Was it one requirement? Was it two? Uh, what does it mean for a law to be neutral? What does it mean for a law to be generally applicable? None of that was answered in Smith. Three years later, in a case called Lukumi versus City of Hialeah, the court provided some additional guidance, although not much in my view, uh, Jim argues it provided even more guidance in a case called City of Bernie, but I, I disagree with him on that. Bottom line is there hasn't been a lot of guidance. We've had, we've had Smith, Lukumi, a few other lower court cases and the spattering now of some Supreme Court decisions to figure out what does it mean for a law to be neutral and generally applicable. So we have to figure out how to make sense of a rule that was not well thought out. And I'm, what I'm going to do next is show how I think how I think about it. And in, in an article that I published alongside uh, Douglas Laycock, another UT professor, we made some of the following arguments. I want to emphasize, though, that what we're doing in our article is trying to make sense of what we think is kind of a bad rule. This is not the rule that I would propose if I were the all-powerful Lord of the law. Um, and as we'll see, my concern is that in Catholic diocese. The court took a not so well thought out rule and made it worse by applying it by applying it in a not so well thought out way, um, and and that's one of my worries with the Catholic Diocese opinion and and how the COVID cases have been handled. But first, here's how I understand these 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 separate prongs of neutrality and general applicability. They're, they're, they really are two different requirements. Government has to satisfy both if it's going to burden religious exercise. 
The neutrality prong has to do, if you, if you read the case law and look at subsequent cases that have applied it, it really has to do with this idea of targeting a particular religion or religious belief, hostility or animus towards religion. So when government is singling out a specific religion or belief in that, instant, in that instance, you know, discriminating against religion, in that instance, government is not acting neutral. But it seems clear from the court's opinion that there's also a question that, that general applicability is different from neutrality. Uh, it seems to be a different test. And there, I hope as I go through this, you'll start to see how it relates to the COVID-19 orders uh, related to the pandemic. In the series of cases in the years since um, Smith, and as we look at lower courts and how they've tried to make sense of general applicability, uh, Professor Laycock and I, and I have argued that here's how you can understand when a law is not generally applicable. It's not generally applicable if it only replies, applies to religion, but nothing else. And in that instance, oftentimes the prongs of neutrality and general applicability will, will collapse together. Uh, it's not generally applicable if there are individualized exemptions. So in the COVID-19 context, for example, I haven't seen this case, but let's say you have an instance where an individual bureaucrat in government can choose uh, which businesses are essential and which aren't, and it's done on an individualized basis, kind of on the, upon the whims of the government official. In that instance, when those types of individualized exemptions to a law are in place, a law is not generally applicable. A, not, a law is not generally applicable if there are non-religious secular exemptions to the law that endanger the state's interest in a similar or greater degree as the burdened religious conduct. And this is language we get from Lakumi. I want to emphasize that one again because I think it's going to be very important to why I have some qualms about the, the, what, the, what the court has done in some of the COVID-19 cases. A law, I'll say it again, a law is not generally applicable if there are secular exemptions to the law that endanger the state's interest in a similar or greater degree as the burden religious conduct. Um, I'll emphasize too that the exceptions to the law, the secular exemptions to the law, in my view, do not need to be stated in the law's text. They can exist in the law's application. So you might have a law that on its face seems like it's generally applicable, but if, it is, if in its application, there are all these secular exemptions or even one secular exemption, um, that results in a law not being generally applicable and government should have to pass strict scrutiny. Uh, this view of general applicability protects religious minorities who might not otherwise have the ability to protect themselves through the political process. And those, those groups tend to be the victims of laws that burden religious exercise the most. It's those groups who don't have political power or clout to get exemptions written into the laws. And those are the groups we're worried about. And I'll just tell you, one of the uh, beauties that I enjoy as a clinical law professor is getting a constant stream of phone calls of people whose religious exercise is being burdened. It is almost never the case that I receive a call where it's clear to me that government is acting with discriminatory intent. That does happen. But almost always, the calls I'm getting from religious minorities across the country, and these cases have nothing to do with culture war issues, are from people who are simply overlooked in the political process. And that's where they're facing these burdens. So the, the role of general applicability is quite important here. Hopefully, you can see how this relates to the COVID-19 orders. The court uh, had to apply the smith lakumi test because that's still controlling precedent, uh, at least for the time being, as far as we know. So when it's looked at uh, these state orders coming from various state governments, and in particular in New York, it had to ask the question of whether the COVID-19 orders were neutral and generally applicable. And I want to be clear on this as well. I don't necessarily disagree with the outcome in Roman Catholic Diocese versus Cuomo. What I disagree with more than anything is how the court applied the Smith test. Um, I don't necessarily disagree that it did apply it. Um, I think it was trying to ask some of the right questions, but there's a point where it broke down and I'll flesh that out. Um, in particular, I have some concerns with how it tried to apply the general applicability requirement. I think it may have caused more confusion than clarity in the law. In that case, the court concluded that, the gov that Governor Cuomo did not act neutrally because the governor made comments saying that he was targeting the Orthodox Jewish community and because it seemed pretty clear that he had um, burden the orthodox or certain areas based on religion as if he was acting just to kind of circle out certain religious uh, certain areas because that those were orthodox jewish communities 
As far as that goes, I think that makes sense, that that does indicate a lack of neutrality. Um, but then the court goes on to look at general applicability a little bit, although it wasn't very clear precisely what it was doing. This is one of the problems with the court dealing with cases on the shadow docket where it doesn't have time to completely flesh out all of the facts and arguments. But the court concluded that, um, that the, the orders in New York were not generally applicable because Governor Cuomo had made these red zones that limited churches to 10 people, even if those churches could hold 2,000 people. It limited to 10 people while businesses that the government had labeled essential could allow as many as they wanted. And in orange zones, houses of worship were limited to 25 people while even non-essential businesses could decide for themselves how many people to admit. There the court ruled that the laws were not generally applicable because of those discrepancies. I think under Smith, the court applied the right test. It should be looking at whether the laws are neutral. It should be looking at whether the laws are generally applicable. But it seems they didn't really apply the right comparators. The district court and the state had determined that acupuncturists, cat grounds and garages, uh, campgrounds and garages, these type of retail entities did not undermine the state's interest in protecting against the virus to the same or greater degree as religious gatherings. In other words, religious gatherings where large groups of people are coming together in one space to sing and to enchant and engage in other religious ceremonies had a greater potential for spreading the virus than a one-stop visit to the acupuncturist. And the district court had decided that the, the, the churches in this case hadn't met their burden to show that a visit to the acupuncturist or to the garage or to the store undermined the state's interest in protecting against the virus to the same or greater degree as the religious worship. The court, so it seemed to me at least that the court laid the groundwork and I think subsequent lower court cases have proved this, it laid the groundwork where it almost seemed to be saying that if there are any secular exemptions, whether they undermine the state's asserted interest or not, that triggers the compelling interest test. And I don't think that can be the law. I don't think that's, I think that goes explicitly against what the court said in Lakumi. And I think it also doesn't make sense conceptually. There are times when a secular exemption is necessary, but does not undermine the state's interest the same way religion might. And if the test for general applicability is going to mean anything, those secular exemptions need to be allowed. Um, so again, what we ended up seeing then after, after Catholic Diocese versus Cuomo is lots of lower courts kind of declaring that this was now the law, that if there's any secular exemption, whether it undermines the state's asserted interest or not, then strict scrutiny is automatically required if religion is burdened. I don't think that's what neutrality and general applicability require. And so what I'm worried about is what the Supreme Court did is uh, it kind of further, further muddied what is already muddy area of the law. Uh, to be clear, my position is that if the government is going to burden religious exercise, the compelling interest test should apply. But if the court's going to require that, then just say that that's the test. Don't do it in a confusing fashion like this that really leaves all the lower courts not sure as to exactly how to apply the law. Thank you. I think that's my turn. Uh, Steve, Jim, thank you so much. Um, I wish I could be here. I'm in Houston, which is pretty close to Austin, uh, but might as well be a lifetime away. Um, under conventional constitutional doctrine, courts pose familiar questions. Is a right fundamental or non-fundamental? Is a classification suspect or non-suspect? Should a law be reviewed with strict scrutiny or with rational basis scrutiny? But during the COVID-19 pandemic, a novel question prevailed. Was a right essential or non-essential? If a right was deemed non-essential, then the state could regulate, restrict, and even prohibit that right. Modern constitutional doctrine was simply set aside during the emergency. Different states drew different lines. Some states deemed the free exercise of religion and the right to keep and bear arms as essential but access to abortions were deemed non-essential. Other states did the opposite. Religion and guns were non-essential, but abortions were essential. And at least for a point, the courts declined to intervene so long as a state also restricted comparable or analogous activities. Can the free exercise of religion be anything but essential? 
Or can the sole method of obtaining firearms be, de be deemed non-essential? And under controlling Supreme Court precedent, can abortions be deemed mere elective surgeries? Um, these were questions that our constitutional doctrine really was not set up to answer. And I think I'm gonna have some agreement with both my colleague Jim and Steve. Um, I don't know that diocese faithfully applied Smith. I think it was correct. And I think it reached the right result and perhaps it's even better than Smith. But I think this case proved to me at least the limits of Smith and perhaps why this doctrine may be in need of some uh, re-examination. Now, I would be remiss if noting we're not here in a special anniversary, perhaps an inauspicious anniversary. Today is March 11th. Exactly one year ago today, the WHO declared a pandemic. Can you believe it? And March 10th was my last in-person class. I was in a room with 70 people, not a single mask to be found. Um, so we are really on a very, I'll say, inauspicious anniversary. Okay. Um, for purposes of full disclosure, I'm not just an academic, I'm also a litigant here. Uh, I sued Governor Cuomo, among many people who have done that, uh, on behalf of a Jewish school in Queens. So I'm familiar with the animus argument. I'm going to put that aside now because I think that's a sort of a table issue. I don't think the court ruled um, uh, on the animus issue. So I want to focus on the, uh, uh, the issue of applicability, right? So the question is this, right? And I think Steve set up the issue quite well. Um, how much latitude or deference does the state get when they're deciding which secular businesses to exempt and which not to exempt? Um, this issue is muddied for a lot of reasons, one of which we're in the shadow docket, Steve mentioned that, where the court does not have full briefing. Um, another reason why these issues are muddied is it arose during a pandemic. It arose during a pandemic in which we did not have full information. We weren't dealing with known quantities like animal sacrifice in Lukumi or peyote, which is in Smith, uh, things we know. We we're dealing with an evolving pandemic where we didn't know the future. Um, the case is also muddy because the composition of the court had changed. When South Bay was decided back in May of 2020, Chief Justice Roberts was at the center of the world. He was the new Zeus, right? He, he decided what, he was a new Justice Kennedy for about like six months, he had a good run. Uh, but then when Justice Ginsburg passed away, we welcomed Justice Barrett uh, into the Rose Garden, <clears throat> right, sorry. Um, the court changed. And one of our first and most consequential decisions was to side with the majority in the diocese case. <sighs> Lurking in the background, of course, is another name that has not been said, but it's Fulton. Yes, Fulton. Jim's nodding. Uh, this is a case from Philadelphia, uh, which uh, considered whether a, a Catholic um, adoption agency um, uh, Jim's going to yell at me if I get the facts wrong, but it was the Catholic Adoption Agency and a policy requiring non-discrimination and the interaction of how these Catholic adoption agencies have to deal with gay uh, parents who are looking to adopt. I'll leave the facts there because I know the facts are really messy. Fulton asked the court to overrule Smith. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, maybe Jim might disagree, but I don't think that's going to happen. But the court might tweak Smith. And I think we're sitting here talking about a doctrine that is very close to being rejiggered. And I indeed think the, the diocese case was kind of like a, like a preview, a, a penumbra, if you will, of what's going to happen in Fulton. And I think maybe to Steve's chagrin or Jim's dismay, um, I think the court's going to expand what it means to be neutral and generally applicable, right? I think the existing jurisprudence is, is fairly constrained. Um, and I think what the court will say is we're going to be more uh, skeptical when the court grants certain types of uh, exemptions. In other words, uh, let's say that Smith defined what neutrality means in a fairly narrow fashion. Now the state's going to have a bigger burden. And if the state has a bigger burden, we start running headlong into basically almost like a RIFRA standard, like the compelling interest test that, 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 that Steve mentioned a few moments ago. So it, it's really tough for me to write and speak um, about the free exercise clause at this exact point in time more likely looking at a revolution, okay? Now, I wanna actually talk, Steve is far too modest, about Justice Kavanaugh's dissent in a case called, he's smiling, in a case called Calvary Chapel. And in my mind, um, that was probably the most 
rigorous opinion we've seen throughout the entire run of these cases. He, Justice Kavanaugh, put some thought into this. And he cited Professor Laycock and Professor Collis's uh, articles, I think it's in Nebraska, if I remember correctly, a law review. Um, and I just want to talk about Justice Kavanaugh for a minute. He, he hasn't really come back to it. I think he's kind of ignored it. And for reasons I can talk about later, but he, he articulated this perspective. And he said like this, um, he analogized the First Amendment and the Free Exercise Clause to a most favored right. If you know international trade law, it's called a most favored nation status, right? What does that mean? Um, if the United States says that the United Kingdom is the most favorite nation for trade, and the UK, I'm sorry, and the United States gives some privilege to, let's say, France, as a matter of course, whatever privilege US gives to France, we have as a matter of right to give to the UK, barring some, you know, some unusual circumstances. And that's an analogy that Laycock had in a paper, you know, more than 30 years ago. But that's sort of analogy that Justice Kavanaugh uses. In other words, um, if any secular activity is given this sort of exemption, right, then presumptively the religious group can as well. But it's a presumption. It's not an absolute. And presumptions can be rebutted. At that point, this, the state, the government must come forward with evidence, not supposition, not innuendo, evidence demonstrating why they've given this privilege to a secular activity, but denied, but denied that privilege to the most favored right, which is the free exercise of religion. Um, I think Steve might be troubled by that extension. I'm not. Uh, I, I was on the fence about Smith before COVID, and I think COVID pushed me over the fence. I think the rule is unworkable. Um, you know, I don't think I'm with Justice Brennan all the way on the Sherbert test. I think that may, perhaps goes a little too far. Um, but I, I'm open now, especially after litigating against Governor Cuomo now for the last couple months. Um, I think I see I see the light. Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, I, w I was truly on the fence beforehand, but this, this this pushed me over. But if we start from the presumption that the free exercise of religion is the sort of most favored right, it's an enumerated right in the Constitution, it should be the burden of the state to show why they're violating it. And perhaps the state can show that uh, there's evidence that, um, uh, you know, people are singing and chanting, and this is truly more dangerous than just sitting in a liquor store or a pet store, whatever else the, the examples were before. I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, but what people don't realize is the churches in New York were all wearing masks. They had banned singing. They had timed entry and exit to minimize spread. There were no cases traced to any of these ginormous sanctuaries. Um, you know, the state can produce supposition, uh, but I don't think they can make the case. Uh, all they wanted was to have 50% capacity, the same as other large assembly groups, right? If you're sitting on an airplane for three hours or a bus or a train, you don't have distancing, right? <laughs> People maybe wearing masks, maybe not. They're talking, they're whatever. Um, it's the state's obligation to justify why religion is being treated worse. Now, Justice Kavanaugh didn't extend this point in the Roman Catholic diocese, much to my dismay. I don't know why. It, I wish he did. It was his best. It was the best thing Brett's written since he joined the court. Best things written by far. Um, but he sort of pulled back. Uh, but Catholic diocese by itself, I'm with Steve, doesn't really explain the rationale. It wasn't on targeting because so it doesn't affect Catholics. It affects Jews. Uh, it's got to be something else. Um, I hope, I think I'm almost out of time. Uh, thank you for your reminder, Kylie. I, I hope and I trust that when we get Fulton, we get some more light in the situation. Um, but as things stands now, we're going to be of a mire. I don't know what the law is, um, and it's not clear. And I, I didn't say the name John Roberts once. I, I, was, I told myself I wouldn't do it, and I didn't. Did not say Roberts once. Good. All right, I'm done. Jim, please, after you. Well, thank you, Josh, and thanks to everyone and to FedSoc for, for hosting us. So I wanna start with some common ground um, because although Steve started off by saying, you know, our discussion tonight is about whether the COVID cases are being rightly decided under current doctrine as laid out in Smith and, and the debates about what does Smith mean, I, I think we might have common ground in all three of us thinking that the court should revisit Smith and, you know, take a look at it and consider whether it should it go back to Josh referenced the Sherbert case, the Brennan view and Sherbert and apply strict scrutiny to all burdens on religious practice. Should it do something more like what it does in free speech when government action incidentally burdens speech should 
when government action incidentally burdens religion, should it apply a modestly heightened scrutiny, but shift the burden to the government? I've, I've made that argument. It sounds like Josh may be in a, in a somewhat uh, similar place on that, but, but whatever it does, it should do it openly and honestly and explain what it's doing. I think at the end of what Steve said, he, you know, he mentioned the COVID cases kind of lead things in a state of confusion. And I think that's right. I just want to emphasize, I think we've had 60 years of confusion. And the reason we've had 60 years of confusion is the court has been dishonest with each twist and turn on this fundamental question of whether or not the free exercise clause not only protects against discrimination by government against religious practice, but whether it also provides some right to religious exemption or religious accommodation when general laws incidentally burden our religious practices. On that question, whether there's a right to religious exemption or accommodation, the court first said no, explained why. Then in 1963, Brennan says, absolutely yes, there's a right to religious exemption. Backed by strict scrutiny, doesn't address the language in the old cases saying no. Then in 1990, Justice Scalia writing for the majority of the court says, no, there's no right to religious exemption pretends like they've never recognized the right to religious exemption in the previous cases. And now the court in the COVID cases appears to be going back to, there is a right to religious exemption, but it's not gonna to explain to it, it to us either in Roman Catholic diocese, although at least we got a short opinion explaining something, even if you don't buy what they said in the case. Um, but then more recently in the South Bay two case involving California's restrictions and the Gateway City case involving Santa Clara County's restrictions on gatherings, where the court in the shadow docket decisions gives us no explanation, no effort to reconcile the decisions that are effectively exempting religion from the COVID rules, no effort to reconcile it with Smith and City of Bernie. So I think we probably have common ground on the court should do a better job of explaining what exactly it's doing uh, in its jurisprudence. Is it changing its jurisprudence? Several lower courts, the Seventh Circuit, the Ninth Circuit, have said that Roman Catholic diocese was a seismic shift possibly in free exercise jurisprudence. More recently, the Seventh Circuit said things have changed considerably since we first started deciding these cases. It's unusual for things to change considerably on a constitutional right and the doctrine governing a constitutional right in shadow docket decisions. Um, but that appears to be where we are. On the, on the question though, let me go back to the point of departure. I think the point of departure, particularly between Steve and I, I, I don't know uh, whether Josh would, would also disagree with me. Um, I think Steve's, you know, Steve mentioned that he's got clients that come to the clinic and it's almost never about government intentionally discriminating. It's religious minorities who have been neglected in the political process. And the implication is the free exercise clause should protect against that. And of course, I agree normatively that it should. But Smith was crystal clear that it does not. Smith said at the end of its opinion um, that, that its opinion would leave religious minorities at a disadvantage. But that was you know, something that had to be accepted to keep the court out of the unacceptable business of balancing religious practice with government, um, with government uh, interests. Um, the exact language was um, the Smith court acknowledged that its rule would quote, place at a relative disadvantage those religious practices that are not widely engaged in. It acknowledged religious minorities were not gonna fare well under the Smith, under the Smith rule. Again, I think we should change that, but if we're going to be faithful to Smith, we have to accept that that's what the court, the court said. Um, in terms of uh, the Lukumi decision, as, as Steve pointed out, it laid out both this neutrality and general applicability uh, requirements, and Steve made the case that only neutrality is about targeting religion. Um, and general applicability adds something. It's not about targeting uh, religion. And I actually think that had Lukumi been the court's last word uh, on this, this matter, you could make that argument. The Lukumi court didn't hold that, um, but they, you, you could make that argument. But unfortunately, for that perspective, there's a subsequent case, the city of Bernie case, um, where the Supreme Court of the United States strikes down the Religious Freedom Restoration Act as, as applied to the states. And um, counsel for the Archbishop of San Antonio, um, Archbishop Flores was Professor Laycock. Um, and in his brief for the Archbishop, he made the argument that Steve laid out that general applicability isn't just about targeting. It also is triggered in situation where a secular exemption is granted, then a religious exemption is required. And, and the free exercise clause is not just about protecting against hostility and against animus. Um, and it should be easier to perhaps easier to uphold the Religious Freedom Restoration Act 
under the free exercise clause than it was to uphold the Voting Rights Act under the Equal Protection Clause because the free exercise clause may require government to justify its decisions in more cases than the Equal Protection Clause requires justifications in, in race cases. And Professor Waycock lost that case. The Supreme Court struck down RIFRA as applied to the states and it explicitly in comparing it to the Voting Rights Act context said, here, the problem was Congress didn't identify laws, state laws animated by animus and hostility. And the problem here is that Congress is purporting to enforce the free exercise clause by limiting state laws that don't have the object of stifling or punishing religion. So in order to be covered by the free exercise clause, in order to violate the free exercise clause, Bernie makes, city of Bernie makes it pretty clear, state laws have to have the object of stifling or punishing religion. And, and Congress can enforce the free exercise clause by going after laws that don't. Well, that's exactly what these recent COVID cases do. The court is doing exactly what it said Congress couldn't do in city of Bernie. The court is requiring religious exemptions from laws that don't have the object of stifling and punishing religion. Now, maybe you could argue, and both Josh and, and Steve alluded to this, maybe you could argue that Roman Catholic Diocese actually was a case involving a law that was animated by the object of stifling or punishing religion. Maybe you could argue that. Um, but the Santa Clara regulations, there is not a hint of animus or hostility or object of targeting. Santa Clara went out of its way to say, we're not doing essential, you know, characterizing who's essential and who's not essential. We are distinguishing between gatherings, which are high risk, whether they're in religious places or secular places, and non-gatherings, whether they're in religious places or secular places. And you, know, you can go to church to pray, to go to confession, to engage in transactions, to get counseling, but you can't gather in the church. Just like you can go to the bookstore to buy a book, but they can't hold a book reading at the bookstore. Completely religiously neutral in Santa Clara. There's no argument that there was the object of punishing or stifling religion, yet the Supreme Court required Santa Clara to exempt churches from the COVID uh, regulations. And I submit the court is now doing exactly what it said Congress couldn't do in the city of Bernie uh, cases. And these decisions cannot be reconciled uh, with Smith. Uh, again, I do think the court should consider uh, overruling Smith. I'm not sure though that that would mean the churches should win in these cases because there is also a free speech problem, which is uh, the court in a case called Heffron many years ago involving a religious organization that wanted to uh, at a state fair uh, spread its word and solicit um, throughout the state fair when the rule said everybody who wants to solicit and spread the word has to do so uh, whether secular or religious in a particular place. And, and the court ruling against the religious organization said, religious organizations don't have rights, free speech rights superior to other organizations. And so one of the problems with ruling in favor of the churches in the COVID cases is that religious folks who wanna assemble get that right, but secular groups aren't getting that right. And that has serious free speech implications that I think hasn't been addressed. Uh, Justice Kagan alluded to it in one of her opinions. I think it was in the South Bay Two uh, opinion, but I think that discussion has not been adequately addressed. And so my time is running out, so I'm gonna stop there so we could turn it over to our, our moderators and questions and answers. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Professor. So now we're gonna move to a time question and answer. Um, I think that Kylie's gonna take point on that. Um, so, but I'll, I'll be around as well. Yeah, so um, our first question, Professor Oleski, I think you touched on this, but I'd like to hear a little more from you as well as the other two panelists. Could you postulate as to why the court is failing to explain its shift toward granting religious exemptions or what strategy it's trying to employ? Um, are they trying to avoid directly overruling Smith, which I, I think is maybe what you were touching on. And this ties into a question from um, Uriel Hinberg, who asks, you know, maybe this is their way of overruling Smith without actually overruling Smith. What are your thoughts on that? Well, so I, I wrote an article in 2019 warning that the use of the most favored nation theory of religious exemptions was the way in which the court was going to Overrule Smith without saying it's going to overrule Smith. Good job. <laughs> I, I, I didn't predict COVID. I didn't expect it to happen in these cases. I thought a case like Fulton was the kind of case where it might happen or a future case like Masterpiece Cake Shop. 
or in Masterpiece Cake Shop itself, where, Gore, where Justice Gorsuch indicated that he was ready to go there. Um, he, Professor Waycock and, and Professor Tom Berg wrote a brief uh, making the most favored nation argument in that case, and Justice Gorsuch was amenable uh, to it. So I didn't expect it to be on the shadow docket in the COVID cases, but yes, I think that's what's going on. I don't know, I, I understand that the court's always reluctant to overturn precedent, but at this point, given how many times the court has reversed itself on religious exemptions with, and it's pretending all these cases are good law, all these are reconcilable cases on its doc, on its, um, on the books are good law. I, I think the time has come to just be honest. Uh, and I hope whether it's in Fulton or whether it's in some future case, the justices are just honest about what they're doing because so far uh, they have not been. Can I, can I jump in on that a little bit, Kylie? I, I was just going to say, I, I think, Jim and I largely agree. I mean, I think one of the big shifts that happened since 1990 with Smith in the year 2021 is you saw you saw the culture war battles really start start to take a lot of movement and gain a lot of steam. And Smith has become affiliated with the culture war battles. I to the extent that the Supreme Court and the justices are worried about being seen as a political body, I think directly overruling Smith is going to leave them open to that charge. So that could be at least one motivation while they're trying, why they're trying to dance around it. That said, I agree with Jim. I think they just need to take it head on and admit what they're doing. And, you know, whatever tests they're going to adopt, either it's, it's some kind of intermediate scrutiny that Jim has asked for, or just straight up the compelling interest test, at least it forces all players to admit where their priorities are and what's doing the work for them and what's not, right? What do they think is a compelling interest? What is not? Instead of we, we've got this, like I say, muddy waters where it's difficult to know where people's priorities are. The, the ball is constantly being, being hidden in these cases. And I think it does a disservice to everybody, quite frankly. Yes. We have a, another question from Warren Bloom, who, you know, in the, the vein of overruling Smith, what test would you replace Employment Division v. Smith with? Or what, what test do you think the court should adopt should Smith be revisited? Um, he really wants to know what test do you think hues most closely to the original public meaning of the free exercise clause and, and stays the most faithful to that? Uh, I'll go um, first. You know, it's, it's a really, it's a really good question. Um, I think Steve and Jim, their history was excellent. You know, we had a case called Reynolds back from the 1890s or 1880s. Uh, you had a, a, a Mormon who was prosecuted for polygamy. And the court basically said, uh, yeah, too bad. Your religion lets you have beliefs, opinions, but you can't engage in action. Um, and then you have Justice Brennan, who just made up this elaborate compelling interest test with the least restrictive means test. He, I mean, Jim's smiling, but I mean, it was just sort of just put out there. It's like, okay, we got the votes. Here we go. We're Brennan. We're going to do it. Remember, yeah, for WandaVision fans, it was Brennan all along. Basically, almost all of our modern day common law problems come from William Brennan. It's, it's remarkable, uh, only slightly exaggerating. Um, and then we have Justice Lee saying, haha, bye bye, Brennan. We have a conservative court now. And now the court sort of is, well, now we're even really more conservative because it's Christians who are coming after, not, not, uh, not uh, uh, Indians and uh, Seventh-day Adventists. So we have this weird flux. What test would be consistent with originalism? Uh, I'll be honest here. The court has not done a good job on originalism with free exercise. Uh, the court has not done a good job with religion on free speech either. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, Steve, I, I actually haven't looked into the question. Do you have any thoughts on what would what would be the originalist test? Is it, is it Reynolds? Is it basically saying we have no scrutiny that this is all just made up? I mean, I see if I haven't looked at the question carefully. I don't know. Well, I would just refer people to both the, the, the great two articles on this, in my opinion, are Michael McConnell's article about, you know, understanding of historical free exercise claims and then Philip Hamburger's counter article. And you can look at both of them. That's a great in-depth history to how people were thinking about exemptions at the time and whether or not they were something that people generally accepted. All that said, I've read both those articles like a million times. I've never been convinced as to one outcome or the other as to precisely what the test should be from an original public meeting perspective. For me, I, I, I think it should be the compelling interest test, uh, but that's, you know, I have all sorts of normative reasons for that. That's, that's where, how I get there, but I don't think it's not based on originalism. Would you take compelling interest but not least restrictive means, maybe chop it in half, maybe no. more conventional strict scrutiny? I think for me, it'd just be full-blown strict scrutiny. And a lot of people don't like that. Um, 
because they say, well, when we tried to apply that historically, what we ended up with is, you know, it wasn't really strict scrutiny as, as to the way we apply when you compare it to the way strict scrutiny gets applied in other contexts, right? It's uh, strict in theory, but feeble in fact when it comes to religion is what a lot of people have argued. But I think so many of those decisions can be explained on their facts. And look, if the government truly has a compelling interest, it's taking the most narrow means possible to get there, then it's okay under the compelling interest test for the religious exercise to be burdened. But I think, I think that test forces government to be upfront about what interest it's trying to achieve. And it forces litigants and parties and others to have a discussion about whether or not that interest is truly compelling. And for something as important as religious exercise, that's what I think we should be thinking about. If I could get in on, on this, I, I agree with both Josh and, and, and Steve. Originalism has up to now done no work in the court's decisions. You know, in concurring opinions, O'Connor and, and, and uh, Scalia debated it in City of Bernie. Um, but majority opinions, you know, Justice Scalia, the preeminent originalist on the court of his time, did no originalism in Smith. And Justice Kavanaugh, who uh, Josh was mentioning uh, earlier, and Justice Gorsuch, who's written sim similar opinions in these, these COVID cases, um, is doing no originalism, relying on a most favored nation theory, which again, Professor Laycock developed in 1990. Um, and then they're supercharging it because a critical element of the test, which Steve described earlier, that it's only triggered if the granted secular exemption is analogous or comparable and undermines the state interest to the same effect, Kavanaugh gets rid of that. Doesn't have to have a comparable secular uh, analog. So we're so far from any you know, tenuous connection to, to originalism that at this point, I think, and Josh pointed out free speech you know, doctrine is, is, is largely not originalist. At this point, I, I'm not sure um, we're gonna see an originalist uh, solution. And, and so my, my proposal has been, well, do something analogous to what you do in free speech law. Incidental burdens do trigger some scrutiny but they don't trigger the same scrutiny as targeted burdens. We don't think that incidental burdens imposed by the government are as problematic as targeted burdens by the government. Do you, do you mind if I ask you a follow-up on that, Professor Oleski? Could you give us, I mean, so I, I was about to ask you that question before you said it, but I'm gonna rephrase my question a little bit and say, do you, can you give us an example of what you think might be I mean, incidental and targeted? We have those terms, terms have limited meaning. What do you think would be a, in a government action that would trigger strict scrutiny for free exercise claim? And what do you think would trigger some sort of lesser, you know, time, manner, place style, First Amendment free speech? Yeah, so um, the example I often give you just very simple, if, if the state of Oregon uh, passed a law saying Catholics couldn't use sacramental wine, uh, that would trigger strict scrutiny. Everybody would agree that would trigger scrut strict scrutiny. Or if they didn't say Catholics, but there was clear evidence that that was the object, the purpose of the law was to to prevent Catholics from using sacramental wine, that would trigger uh, strict scrutiny. But if Oregon decides to become a dry state and nobody can drink or, or uh, sell or purchase uh, alcohol, then the law is not targeted at Catholics. But of course, from the Catholics perspective, the effect is the same. They can't use sacramental wine. That's the kind of case where a lower level of scrutiny would apply rather than um, strict scrutiny. And one last follow-up question. Sorry, and then we can move on. How is that not Smith? That second category well, sounds very Smith, much like Smith applies. Smith Smith applies deferential rational basis in the case where there's an incidental burden. In my my proposal is no, like in free speech law, shift the burden to the government. And once you make that shift, even if it's not strict scrutiny, I mean, think about rational basis with bite in the equal protection context. Once you shift the burden to the government people start winning cases. And my, my example of this is Title VII. People talk about the Title VII reasonable accommodation requirement as being too weak because it was watered down with the de minimis language and TWA from Mrs. Hardison. But people win reasonable accommodation claims all the time. And the EEOC reaches settlements on behalf of the employees all the time. So just shifting the burden there to the employer to justify refusal of an accommodation or here to the government to justify a refusal of accommodation. I think does the important work of capturing the neglected minorities that Steve talks about, but doesn't treat incidental burdens with the, you know, the, the strict scrutiny test that we apply to invidious discrimination. You know, uh, someone, I see a question in the chat which actually relates about Justice Kavanaugh burdens. In Calvary Chapel, Kavanaugh said the state has a burden. In the South Bay 2 case, Barrett wrote a concurrence saying that the 
church bears the burden on singing and chanting and Kavanaugh joined that, which is why I think he retreated. I think he either changed his mind or had second thoughts. He got, got cold feet. Um, but the burden is essential. I'm with Jim. In con law, for all of you litigators out there, if you have the burden, you're probably going to lose. Uh, that's It's a good rule of thumb. If the burden's on you, you have a much harder job, and it's always hard to meet your burden. I would love when the other guy's a burden, when it's my burden, like, oh, no, rational basis is my burden. I'm going to lose. Oh, you have the burden? All right, I win. All right, so burdens are important. Yeah, uh, on that point, Josh, you know, I, the, the first thing I thought of when Catholic Diocese came out was who had the burden here to show that these analog, that these secular exemptions were analogous or not. And, and the way I've been thinking about it is initially the burdens on the church, the burden is on the churches to show that there are secular exemptions that are analogous. Mm -hmm. As soon as they make that mm -hmm. showing, then the burden should sh shift to the government to show they've got a compelling reason for doing it. But that's one of the reasons I kind of struggled with Catholic diocese is it didn't appear to me that the churches had met that burden of showing evidence that, you know, going to the acupuncturist is the same thing as meeting in a, in a large church uh, meeting. So anyway, that's a long winded way of saying I agree with you on the burden. It's very important where the burden ends up in determining how cases turn out. So I have a, I, I'm particularly interested with the question that Jennifer uh, Sirigianis just asked. Um, she said, will any proposed test in lieu of Smith open the door to revisiting Reynolds? And then do recent cases like Lawrence, Windsor, and Obergefell offer support? So I guess this is kind of getting at the like hybrid claims where you might have a, a, both a free exercise and liberty interest in something like Reynolds. So curious to hear your thoughts on that. Reynolds, the polygamy case? Mm -hmm. It's so funny. One of my students asked me the same question in class on Wednesday. So you guys are thinking the right level. I mean, look, Reynolds and Smith are on, are on a similar wavelength. I mean, they're not exactly the same, but they're on a sort of similar wavelength. Um, I, don't, I don't know where the court's going. I, I, I think also one of the reasons, you know, maybe I'll be charitable. Maybe diocese was so muddled because they haven't made up their minds in Fulton yet. Maybe they're still fighting over it. And they're like, okay, crap. We have to decide this now. We can't let this shadow doc case linger forever. Let's just put some garbage. We'll clean it up in June. I mean, that's also possible, right? You know, just, you know, it, it, it's like when you have a final paper due at the end of the semester, if your professor wants a draft halfway through, you give him some crappy drafts. And it's like, okay, I'll clean up later. You know, you, you all know what I'm talking about. You all know. You're also, I can't see you, but I know you're smiling at the screen right now. Jim's smiling too. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Just one, one point on the Reynolds, you know, I, for folks who might be subject to criminal prosecution in, 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 the, in the handful of states that uh, make it a crime to hold yourself out as married to, to multiple people when you're legally married to one person, I, you know, I think the Lawrence decision in the due process um, path provides the most obvious um, relief and for having a different result than Reynolds rather than the free exercise clause. And I would just say, I would just say, I, I think, some of it depends on how they revisit Smith, because Josh is right. Smith and Reynolds are kind of linked at the hip in many respects. I mean, Scalia relied on Reynolds. He, he, you know, he uses the language from Reynolds, where in Reynolds they express the concern that if we allow an exemption here, or we allow religious exemptions, every man will become a law unto himself. And that's exactly what Justice Scalia relied on in justifying Smith. So if they revisit Smith and they explicitly target that idea, this concern about everyone will become a law unto themselves, that would have the kind of, you know, it's a facto effect of overruling Reynolds. But I, I don't know if they're going to do that. I think Reynolds is so, is old enough now that it'll probably sit by itself and they'll just deal with Smith. But. Or maybe they'll say have a constitutional right to polygamy and just bypass the issue altogether. <laughs> a thruple, as they say. <laughs> so jumping back into the meat of Catholic Diocese, we have a question from Will Leathers, um, and he was wants to know if we can really separate the essentialness determination from the analogous secular activities discussion in Roman Catholic Diocese. And he notes that Justice Gorsuch seems to point out that the real neutrality general applicability issue is the government's deeming religion as non-essential regardless of what the resulting capacity restrictions may be. And then he offers an example where, you know, totally dissimilar activities may be regarded as essential for completely different reasons. And the problem is that the government selected religion for disfavor. So for all three panelists, what are your thoughts on that? 
I'll go first. So I have two papers coming out. I put a link for sort of a merge version, but one of them is actually in the Texas Review of Law and Politics. I'm announcing it uh, called The Essential Second Amendment. It'll be coming out, I don't know, later this year at some point, I suppose. And in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, The Essential First Amendment. And um, this word essential became so duh, essential, right? It became the critical phrase. And I think Gorsuch really nailed it. We had never dealt with this idea that you can create an entire category of non-essential activities and ban them outright. It's why the COVID cases were so strange. And I don't know how much juice they have beyond the current moment. I mean, we're here, we're living it, we're still wearing masks and unvaccinated, but where does this go? But, but this idea of saying, oh, it's not essential. And I blame, here I blame John Roberts. He, it's his fault. If he had nipped this in the bud in May and put some teeth into it, I don't think we've had this sort of blind deference saying, oh, it's not essential. So you can just shut down uh, churches. You can shut down firing ranges. You can shut down abortion clinics. Pick your poison, right? I have poor choice of words, the last one. But right, it's just, it's a, uh, <laughs> sorry, bad. But this word essential became way too important. I think we need to be very careful about um, extending this jurisprudence. So uh, what I'd like to say on this is that I, I think there are two different um, distinctions running through a lot of these cases and a lot of the state and local regulations. You know, one is this essential, non-essential distinction. The other is gatherings and non-gatherings. And, and the gatherings and non-gatherings distinction is based on risk, that if you're going to sit for an extended period of time in a place, that's more risky than if you're going in a transitory way to, to, to some place. Um, the essential non-essential, if that's all the, the, the government was relying on, and it was putting churches on the non-essential side of that line, well, that would indicate some judgment that religion is, is not essential. My understanding, most jurisdiction, that's not actually what's happening. The essential non-essential, the work that's doing is trying to say, there are certain businesses that are non-essential that we, we shouldn't even have them operating. Uh, yeah, and then we have essential businesses, which, you know, they need to be operating. And so we're going to have rules that allow them to operate. But that is separate and aside from, you know, should we allow gatherings, whether they're in secular places, lecture halls, concert halls, sporting events, bookstores for book readings, or whether they be in religious places for religious ceremonies. And so to the extent um, jurisdictions are relying on that gathering, non-gathering distinction, and, and that's tied to risk of getting COVID, I think they're on much safer ground than characterizing, you know, religion is not essential and other things as essential. If I could just briefly reply, uh, the best example is soup kitchens, right? Churches were allowed to have people gather in their building to eat, but not to pray. And indeed prayer has to be done with a mask and eating it without a mask. The reason why is people are supposed to need to eat, but they don't need to pray. So there's a value judgment. And there's a good opinion by Judge Sutton, who was also in the Bernie case, where he drew a line between uh, a life-sustaining and soul-sustaining. And he seemed to think that the states in those cases argued that religion was soul sustaining, not life sustaining. And that's a value judgment that I, I don't think under at least my view of the free exercise clause, that's, that's a value judgment the state can make. Uh, if it was just gathering versus non-gathering, I think it's, it's, it's a harder case. And the, the gateway case from California is tougher. I'm with Jim on that one. Um, but the, the fact is almost every state allowed churches to operate soup kitchens, um, but they couldn't have people pray in the same space. You know, I wonder if, you break bread, that's fine. If you say the Lord's Prayer before that, you have to go to jail, right? You know, um, the example is not, you know, casinos versus churches. That was never a good example. It's the same church can serve food to the homeless, but they can't have people pray in the same facility, the same structure with the same numbers. So um, I think it's important for, for me, at least the way I understand the smith lacumi test is I don't care what the government labels anything. And I think we got too caught up on the government labels, whether it's gathering versus non-gathering. Although I do take Jim's point that gathering versus non-gathering is trying to get at the question of what is the risk for spreading the virus. So I do think that label is better, but the label of essential versus non-essential is irrelevant. The question when you're trying to figure out to get to Will Leather's question, you know, that when you're trying to figure out what is analogous secular conduct, the question is, does the secular exemption undermine the state's interest to the same or greater degree as a religious exemption would? It doesn't matter that the government has labeled the secular exemption uh, essential. They could call it the most crucial business in the history of businesses. I don't care what they label it. The question is, does it undermine the state's interest to the same degree or greater degree than the religious exemption? And if it does, then it's not generally applicable, at least in my view. So I feel like the labels 
became far too important. I think folks on the religious right got way too worked up when they felt like religion wasn't being labeled essential. And the focus really should have just been more on this question of what entities are undermining protecting against the virus more or less. That should have been the focus. And that's really what the government was trying to get at, I think, but perhaps not. I think we're gonna have time for one last question and then any final or closing thoughts from our panelists. But really quickly, um, so the court has been reluctant to you know, dive into the meat of Smith or that you know, religious test, but is it possible that the COVID cases might simply stand for the proposition that core religious activities such as mass or Shabbat services are specially protected, whereas other religiously motivated conduct gets the Smith test. Um, but then how do you compare that with the issue of the court determining what is a core religious activity and what is not? You know, is there a narrower reading of Roman Catholic diocese? Oh man, I, I'm, I'm litigating a, school, a case behalf of a Jewish school and Mayor Bloomberg, not Bloomberg, what's his face? De Blasio in New York has argued that religious school is not religious, it's not core. They said that they said that Roman Catholic diocese extends only to prayer, but not to a religious school. Uh, I mean, they pray in schools, so it's an insane argument, but I don't like that sort of core, non-core. I don't know what religion is to different people. Some people, religion can take different forms. A quicker meeting, just sitting in a room that's empty, right? I mean, there are different ways you have religion that aren't always so obvious. So I would be hesitant to have that test. Josh, can I ask you, what what were they basing in the opinion uh, in the Catholic diocese? What were they basing that view on? Was there language they were citing to? No, they just said the case was about prayer, and that's what the case is about. It's only about prayer. There was no argument. They just said this was a case about prayer, and that's all the, as far as the precedent goes. It was like in a footnote, and they buried it, and it was just a, it, it's not wasn't developed at all. It, it, was, it was a qualified immunity argument saying, well, be precise, the mayor was entitled to QI because this is not clearly established because this case only affected prayer. It didn't affect religious schools. That was the specific argument, but they had no quotation that why. I can't wait to have to substitute parties when Cuomo's not in the case anymore because we have an individual capacity claim which survives his resignation or impeachment. So I'm, I'm good to go. <laughs> I, I would just say if, if the question, if I understood the question properly or correctly, it was asking, are the COVID cases going to result in a world where core religious activities are protected, but activities that are not core get the Smith test? I don't, I don't see that happening as a fallout from the COVID cases personally. I, I just didn't see anything in the cases that would justify that outcome personally. Can I just say though, I, I do think it's un very unlikely this will become part of doctrine because you know one thing the court's been pretty consistent on, we shouldn't be deciding what's core and what's not core, what's important, what's not important in terms of religious practices. But I actually think as a realistic matter, it has been doing some work in, in the cases since Roman Catholic diocese that these are worship services that are being restricted. And I, can't, I think it might've been in, in, in a Barrett opinion, but maybe not, maybe it was in the, the procurium in, in Roman Catholic diocese where there's sort of this indication of, it seems to me an inference that this is going to the core of the free exercise clause. Um, so I don't think they're going to make that part of the doctrine going forward, but I think that might have been animating um, some of these decisions. Cool. Well, do any of our panelists have a last word? Well, hearing none, um, we appreciate all of y'all's time. Um, and to our students, um, I hope y'all have a very happy spring break and that you don't spend the whole time reading for class. Please don't do that. Marinate on these, the wise wisdom that we've gotten from these professors in the free exercise cause. So thank you so much, y'all. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And uh, we'll look forward to having y'all back next Thursday, not this Thursday, but the next. Thank you, everyone. Good night, Jim.